Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 734. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is June 1st, 2022. All right, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. We have a really full show today, so I need you to pay attention because we're going to go from one story to the next story to the next story, talking about a host of issues and a host of denominations. You're going to love it because a a lot to talk about. Uh, We didn't record Friday because I had to fly out to Boise, Idaho to go to a wedding. Uh, My niece got married. Uh, I'm a little tired today because I'm, I'm camping the RV on a horse farm. And Kevin's allergic to hay. So I have two Benadryl on board right now. And so my nose is full. And I got some sleepy pills I just took. So we'll get through it. You just you have to be patient with us. George, how are you doing? Oh, I'm just wonderful. Mm-hmm. I had a pre-op appointment tomorrow because uh, today. Because okay. tomorrow I'm having a medical procedure at our local hospital. Outpatient mm-hmm. procedure. Uh, a, it's called a cardio version. version. Yeah where essentially they give me a shock to the heart and push the reset button to clear up some electrical signal problems in my heart. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to get that done and all set to go forward. I I have some sad news, George. What's that? I've gone my whole driving career without without a speeding ticket and without an accident. Mm -hmm. I've never had to file an insurance claim. Mm -hmm. That's changed. When we got to the horse farm Thursday, I parked where we parked last year, and it was raining about two or three inches uh, of rain in, in, in the hour. You, you, you mean you didn't file when Victoria wrecked the Honda? Or? No, this is my first accident. Oh, your first accident. <laughs> my okay. first accident. Okay. You know, yeah, all my kids have tickets and, and, and stuff like that, but I was the good example. Not one accident, not one uh, uh, speeding ticket. And so we started to sink in the mud. And I tried to get out, and as I tried to get out, I, I dinged the uh, the front a little bit and damaged the uh, the fiberglass on the front of the RV. So I have to call Geico and have them arrange someplace to go fix it, and uh, that's going to cost you know me five hundred bucks. Probably cost them four thousand dollars, but that's my first insurance claim, George. Well, your rates will. Uh, do you have accident <laughs> yes, forgiveness? Yes. Uh, well, oh we, you and I are both in Florida, and Florida is no fault insurance. So no matter what, your insurance company pays the full bill if you're a Florida mm-hmm. resident. So, should be interesting. A new adventure with Sasquatch. Let's move on to the news. Uh, first story. What was that? We we're going to talk about. Oh yeah. Okay. We've been talking about COVID now since probably March of 2020 or maybe February 2020. We told you it's coming. Uh, when I got here, we told you this changes everything. Uh, COVID is going to change the world for the next uh, dozen or so years. And I remember talking about that in April and uh, uh, May as uh, we weren't going back to work. Everybody was sent home, don't come back to work. And the economy was changing. And uh, Trump at the time said we're going to add stimulus dollars, we're going to give people money, and that changes everything. That adds uh, what we call an inflation base. And that doesn't just change America, it changes the whole world. Uh, We get mad at China when they devalue their currency uh, because that changes the dynamics of a world economy. It's really starting to show now uh, in some third world countries and uh, other countries around the world where they no longer have the ability to get uh, cash from a system like America, and they're going to start with riots, they're going to start with uh, uh, killing, they're going to fight for food, they're going to fight for fuel, and this is the riot and chaos phase of the COVID pandemic, George. On the peripheries of the world economy, we're starting to see the cracks form. Mm -hmm. Sri Lanka, the government fell because the islands run out of fuel, and it's run out of food. It has no foreign currency reserves. We printed uh, some letters from the bishops of Sri Lanka, urging calm and noting that during times of economic unrest and crisis, the the Buddhist majority usually takes out their frustrations on Christians. And we uh, even published a story showing uh, there were some Christian uh, Anglican priests in Sri Lanka uh, leading a protest and 
there's a picture of them being attacked by government supporters with canes that's on Anglican Inc. Mm -hmm. So things are pretty bad in Sri Lanka. Uh, but more worryingly, things are really bad in Pakistan. Pakistan is out of foreign currency. It needs to import two and a half billion US dollars worth of fuel each month to keep things going. It doesn't have the money. The Pakistani rupee went from 177 to 200 uh, US dollars in the past few weeks. Uh, 177 rupees to one US dollar to 200 rupees to one US dollar. Wow. So not only are they out of cash, fuel prices have risen on the world market is 50% and the government's fallen and the former government leader imran khan who was a cricket legend has decided this is an opportunity to get back into power and he's leading street protests joined by the muslim extremists and so pa church of pakistan is warning its people be careful uh in previous economic shocks this is when you had suicide bombers come to churches on easter and christmas things are bad in that developing world and we're reading uh it's not yet spread to africa uh, on civil unrest because africa is more food self-sufficient than uh pakistan which has to import food and fuel but there's the fuel fuel stocks are running out in uganda kenya tanzania nigeria even though nigeria produces oil uh th th there's a fuel shortage and the problem is that the, the, the diesel fuel needed to truck the food from the farm to the cities is getting, it's doubling in price. And that's just being passed on to the people. And at a certain point, we're gonna see an explosion you know, across Africa. Um, and what we'll probably see is another series of mass migrant moves into Europe. Hundreds of thousands of people trying to cross the Med for a new life because they think the golden land of Europe is the place where they'll survive. A, a third component to this is uh, several African countries have taken on Chinese debt. They've borrowed money mm -hmm. from China and uh, when they're not unable to pay that, China gets to call the cards in and says, well, mm -hmm. we're going to take this land and we'll be the new owners of this oil field over here and we'll pick that one over there. And, and so there's all these dynamics behind uh, uh, this this post-COVID time. And we're now starting to see it here, not starting, we've seen it here in America. Uh, diesel prices, uh, the reason I'm not driving all over North America, it's it's almost $6 a gallon. Uh, and when you have a 150 gallon tank, that's, that's a, a little pricey. So, we, we've seen inflation here. We're seeing uh, super high gas uh, prices. We're seeing food prices and food shortages even here in America. And this is this is what you know we, we talked about in uh, March and April 2020. The shocks will affect us as Americans probably the least of all in mm -hmm. the developing world because we're food sufficient. Uh, we're just not sufficient with all the crap that you can buy at Walmart. Excuse my language, but yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the stuff we don't really need at Walmart, uh, we have to import from China. But food, and we can, be, and we were fuel uh, sufficient under Donald Trump, but President Biden has shut down pipelines and forbade, and forbade new drilling. But we'll probably come out of this better than other countries where we could see a repeat of uh, Weimar style inflation. Um, I remember a few years ago, I saw a, uh, I think it was like a hundred trillion dollar Zimbabwe in note. You know, it's a curiosity now that you would need a wheelbarrow full of money to buy a loaf of bread during hyperinflation in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. Now, from an Anglican perspective, where is this all going to come out? Christians in uh, Christian minority countries are the scapegoats, usually for economic shocks. You And so we're going to see a heightened persecution. And the churches in Europe, particularly, and the Church of England are going to have to start taking a realistic look at uh, migrant policy. Right now, uh, it's easy to spend uh, cheap, uh, cheap platitudes on, oh, we need to rescue these poor people. But when you have 100,000, 200,000 people a month trying to enter your country, uh, trying to enter the continent of Europe, 
and get on and be supported by your welfare rolls. England, though a wealthy country, is not going to be able to do that. German, Italy can't do it anymore. Yeah. Spain can't do it anymore. Germans, maybe they can do it a little longer, but it's no, a real mess. I, I would say by November, it's every country for themselves. You know, mm -hmm. if if we continue down this path. Now, I would argue, and I'm probably right, maybe not, probably, that inflation was one of the fuels that caused World War II, that caused Germany to, uh, to seek out a, a new leader who would find people to blame for their mass inflation after they had to pay the debt for World War One, and uh, you know I, I would argue that that caused World War two and I would say this flat uh, inflation going on right now maybe something that starts World War three yeah well the, the inflation uh, even though Donald Trump did stimulus so we didn't see inflation right. because uh, there wasn't an accompanying build back better boondoggles of billions of dollars uh, of paying back buddies and insider dealing that we saw in the in the Biden administration coupled with the shocks of the war in the Ukraine mm -hmm. and you know this is a self-inflicted problem when last time we had hyper well, last time we had inflation 73 and 79 73 it was the creation of OPEC yeah and 79 it was the fall of the Shaw so each time oil prices jumped. But this time around, this is totally self-inflicted. This started, the inflation started before Putin invaded. Putin's invasion makes things worse, but he didn't start this. Um, the, the, Janet Yellen, the Secretary of the Treasury, gave a speech the other day, and she said she was absolutely flabbergasted that we had inflation. And, and that's actually scary on a level, because this woman, before being Treasury Secretary, was uh, head of the Federal Reserve, the central bank. And if she doesn't understand how inflation works, that you can't print all these billions of dollars just to print, uh, th that your money becomes worth less and less, uh, we're in trouble. Well, right, so is that our good news story for the day, Kevin, <laughs> that America will get <laughs> hammered least? Oh, I don't know, George. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, we do this to prepare you, okay? Um, I, we need you to be fully informed. You, this is some stuff you're going to hear on the news. You're going to hear indications of this in the news. But I would say your average reporter has no idea. And we're not doing this to be scaremongers. We're just here to let you know that uh, we're seeing signs around the world of countries falling uh, to massive debt. They're not able to uh, feed their people. And when you know this type of starvation looms, people get scared, riot. And if there's no Jews to kill, well, let's kill the Christians. Okay. Well, let's look. Let's take a, a worst case scenario uh, with the collapse of law and order in some of the major cities in the U.S., New York and Seattle and whatnot, Chicago. What's going to happen when we have power outages in a hot July and August? Uh, are we going to see looting? Are we going to see breakdown of civil order as the police are uh, held back, or there are not enough of them? Uh, scary times ahead. Mm. So, keep that in your prayers. Um, the, the most, uh, moving to our next story, um, the most famous tweeter I can think of is Donald Trump. He was kicked off uh, of Twitter, but uh, every morning you'd wake up to news of what he tweeted when he got up at 4 a.m. And uh, he, he, he was a mean tweeter. <laughs> Uh, and really uh, stuck his nose in stuff he probably shouldn't have uh, talked about and expressed himself in ways he shouldn't have talked about. Kevin, I would, say, I would rather have mean tweets and cheap gas. Absolutely. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. As, as I told you, I love him and I hate him. You know, I, I lo love some of what Trump stood for and I hate some of what uh, Trump st stood for. So, uh, you know, Twitter is also its own uh, calamity. Uh, if you got to go on there, you have to have thick skin. And I was interested to see that uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, has taken to Twitter to almost, in Trumpian fashion, stick his nose where it doesn't belong, George. I would go even further. He's three times in this last week has stuck his finger in an electrical socket and yeah. is surprised that he's been burned. Oh, Justin Welby's had a miserable week. He announced the other day that 
he has COVID and cannot preside at the uh, Queen's Platinum Jubilee Ceremony at St. Paul's Cathedral uh, this uh, Friday. Uh, and this is where we stop and say, please pray for the Archbishop of Canterbury and his healing. Don't put all the politics aside here. This is where we as Christians pray for somebody who needs healing. However, George, let's talk about the tweets. <laughs> Justin Welby was famous or infamous for saying we all had a moral duty to be double vaxxed and boosted. He was double vaxxed, double, triple, quadruple boosted, I don't know how many times. And we had a moral duty not to catch the illness to prevent it from spreading to hurting others. Mm -hmm. And this guy catches the illness. Um, it's like Governor Gavin Newsom and the New Zealand Prime Minister, you know, the most fierce supporters of lockdowns alongside Justin Welby, yeah. closing churches and closing buildings and closing economies and closing countries. These three people all seem to come down with COVID the same week. And there's a little bit of poetic justice there. Uh, there's the hypocrisy level of, uh, but, but let's get back to Twitter. So poor Justin is in bed with a, an ice pack on his head, a thermometer in his mouth. He feels miserable. Grabs so the he iPhone. Starts he, <laughs> he starts to tweet, and man, this guy did not think before he hit his thumb on that screen. First, he attacked Boris Johnson over the Partygate issue. Now, for American viewers, Partygate is a flap in England that is really hard for me or most Americans to get any sort of indignation about i mean it's yeah. just like oh, okay uh boris johnson the, the boris johnson uh, and the conservative leadership went to some cocktail and dinner parties and had some booze ups around christmas when they were telling the rest of the country to stay home and stay you know not go out and you're not allowed to do this and that so the government was engaged in hypocrisy Whoa, Kevin, what? I'm shocked. I've never I'm heard shocked. shocked. <laughs> I'm shocked that the government was engaged in, in, in moral hypocrisy and engaged in moral preening. It wasn't like they were the Archbishop of Canterbury or something no, no. and were moral preening. No. So, so there was a, a, a report given that basically said Boris Johnson was a naughty boy and a hypocrite. Well, the Archbishop of Canterbury jumped on the bandwagon and without mentioning his name says, we need to have government leaders whose words we can trust and this and that. Now, anodyne stuff. And usually Justin Welby will get 100 or so responses to a tweet like this, 50 to 100. This time he had mag you know, maybe 10 times as many over the course of the thread. And nine out of 10 were vociferously attacking Justin Welby as a fraud, as a hypocrite. Who are you to get involved in politics? If you want to pronounce, run for office. Mm -hmm. Don't, you know, you're appointed. You have no accountability to anybody. Who are you to say these things? And the degree of the uh, vituperation, the degree of anger was extraordinary. Um, it just was a shock because, you know, he had a nerve. Well, he doubles down by uh, bringing back up the Rwanda asylum issue. Last month, uh, the British government was talking about a plan where they have problems with boat people, uh, like Australia and other countries, except they're migrants from the third world trying to get to England uh, across the uh, British Channel, the English Channel. Uh, from France because French welfare benefits are not as good as English benefits and the British government is saying well these people we should pick up and send and we've agreed to a third party place Rwanda where they can be sorted out who's an economic refugee who's a true asylum seeker who is this or that and they did Rwanda because Rwanda is willing to take them and most of these people are from the developing world well Welby and the leaders of the House of uh, Bishops said, oh, this is immoral. No matter that Australia has been doing this for years. New Zealand and too, yeah. New Zealand's doing this for yeah. years. Many island nations do this. Um, no matter that they're doing it and nobody's had a moral issue with it. Political issue, yes. Moral issue, no. So Welby doubles down on Rwanda again, saying I'm right and I have a, des and I have a right to be right. Again. The response was not an engagement with his argument, but the 
vitriol, vituperation, vitriol against yeah. him. Yeah. And then, just the other day, yesterday, uh, Justin Welby decides to to, bake his, to to stick his finger into the light socket a third time by basically saying we need to be nice to Prince Andrew and say let you know let bygones be bygones. He means well. Now, as you remember, Prince Andrew was a buddy of Jeffrey Epstein, the mm -hmm. late pedophile financier. And Prince Andrew uh, was involved in some lawsuits by girls in the U.S. who were underage, who sued him for having, you know, they were basically concubines of, of Epstein that were shared with Prince Andrew and and, and Andrew th there's there's a, photographic this is a, this is there's photographic evidence he's been sued uh, uh, payouts have been made on behalf of Prince uh, Andrew by uh, the the royalty in uh, the UK so th we're we're not spreading rumors here this is something that really happened. Yeah, and the Queen basically kicked Andrew out of all his honorary positions, colonel of this regiment, leader of that leader of that foundation. Mm -hmm. And Andrew has basically been sidelined, pushed out of the limelight because of his behavior. And there's a real anger in certain quarters in the UK about Andrew and the privilege of the elites. In other words, if uh, a regular person were engaged in the, his sort of behavior, they'd be in jail for uh, statutory rape. Uh, they couldn't just sort of buy themselves out. Well, Welby is now coming to Andrew's defense. And again, the response has been not, you know, more tax than I, Andrew, because that's a, a, that's a target-rich environment. But again, just as a PR week, Justin Welby's raised three political issues and has had this all blown back onto him, covering him from head to toe with Lawrence Fox, who is, a, is an actor, um, a British actor, uh, who ran unsuccessfully for mayor of London. He's a conservative. He started a petition to have the Archbishop of Canterbury fired. And people are signing this petition. Um, it's extraordinary. This is... Uh, that, yeah. that, in other words, it's one thing to have George and Kevin gripe because he doesn't do what they think he should do or he's done things they think are wrong. That's one thing. But this is different. These are uh, people outside the <laughs> Anglican Wars. All of a sudden, George and Kevin look timid and tame compared to the public mob. Well, yeah, but the, this is the same public mob that went after Trump as well. You know, he's getting. If you want to say something on Twitter, you have to have really thick skin. Uh, if you're going to take to, uh, I I have a Twitter account. And I just use it for updates on our, our travels. Uh, it's just not a place where I'm going to post my political opinions or my religious opinions because nobody on there is on there to do good. They're on there to tell you what they think, and I don't care what other Twitter tweeters think. So I'm not going to go on there. I have no desire to know. Um, but in his Trumpian fashion, um, I would suggest, Archbishop, that what a great chance to uh, give theology to Twitter, to shed good news to Twitter, because it needs it. Kevin, I do have a Twitter good news story. Okay. That uses theology. All right. Now, you you and I may not think it's an exactly a good news, but mm -hmm. Mark Andrus, the Bishop of California, was on Twitter. Yes, he was. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> so if you don't know by now, uh, or you didn't watch la last week's episode, Nancy Pelosi has been denied communion mass by the Bishop or Archbishop of California. Which was it? Arch Archbishop Cordelon. 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 Um, so if you're in California, Nancy, and you go to a San Franciscan-based Roman Catholic church, you cannot take communion because I forbade it because of your uh, politics in regards to abortion. The Archbishop over in Washington says, hey, I, I see no problem with your politics. If you want to continue 
uh, receiving communion, you come to a Washington church, you will be received. A Actually, it was a little, it was oh, a little okay. more subtle than that. Okay. Washington. It was more like on an MC Hammer line. Can't touch that. Can't touch uh, that. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go there. I. I don't. I didn't get the paper this week, so I don't know. You know. See no evil, heal no evil, say no evil. So oh. a, a lone voice back in California, who we haven't heard from for a long time, says, "Well, you can come. You can come have communion with us." Oh dear Lord. So what's the story there, George? Mark Andrus, the Episcopal Bishop of California, which is the San Francisco Bay Area, yeah. has invited Nancy Pelosi to worship at the Episcopal Church. And he published a letter saying that the Episcopal Church's views on abortion are just the same as Nancy Pelosi's. And we just so love you, Nancy. You are a wonderful human being. Well, first off, no, the Episcopal Church's views on abortion are not Nancy Pelosi's abortion. Mark Andrus's Yes, views. views on abortion are akin to Nancy Pelosi, but I think the sentiment on Anglican Inc.'s Facebook page when we posted this story and the letter that Mark Andrus sent to Nancy Pelosi was, oh, I saw it, I, I knew this was going to come, but I didn't expect it to come so quickly, where the Episcopal Church looks utterly, utterly f foolish. We worship Moloch too, come on over. <laughs> It's like, oh, that was so bad. Oh, but, you know, Mark Andrus was trying to be nice on Twitter, Kevin, mm -hmm. by saying Nancy Pelosi's a wonderful Christian and human being and should become an Episcopalian. And I think Archbishop Corded Lone of San Francisco agrees. He probably thinks, Nancy, <laughs> be an Episcopalian, drop the charade, oh, uh, and uh, sign up for the team that really wants you instead of the team that uh, doesn't want you. Okay, well, I, then I find it interesting. Um, Pope Francis announced some new cardinals, and he didn't pick the more qualified Archbishop from Washington. He... Oh, he did pick the more. Yeah, he didn't pick the more qualified uh, San Franciscan Archbishop. He picked the one from Washington, who was okay with Nancy Pelosi's politics. Well, Wilton Gregory already was a cardinal. Yeah. But there was only there were twenty one cardinals chosen, and Cor de Leon was passed over for a person of lesser prominence, a less important seat. Bishop McElroy, not even Archbishop, Bishop yeah. McElroy of San Diego. And 21 cardinals, one from Mongolia, a lot from Africa. So Fra Francis, in one sense, is sort of broadening its geographic base, but then among the Western cardinals, he's bringing in his loyalists. And in the case of McElroy, this is part of Theodore McCarrick's team. That McCarrick, the former disgraced Archbishop of Washington, who was defrocked for being a child abuser, that McElroy is one of his people. McElroy, Rod Dreher has a detailed article on this point where McElroy was confronted uh, uh, by sex abuse allegations and uh, by the church people doing the work on this, and McElroy basically ignored it, had nothing to do with it. McElroy is a big supporter of gay and lesbian rights and same-sex marriage. He's just like the Germans on this issue. So the one promotion to the ranks of the College of Cardinals in the United States was somebody way out in left field that uh, uh, probably is giving Catholic traditionalists heart failure because... Well, I have some Facebook friends who are critics of the the Roman Catholic Church here in America and their posts all the time uh, different LGTBQ events that are happening in Roman Catholic churches around the nation you know that mm -hmm. that you know more so than uh, I see from the Episcopal Church so I'm, I'm not surprised I'm not surprised at all uh, <laughs> moving on to our next story uh, Great introduction to this. If you've been watching the news in the last five or six years, you may note that people of color or LGBTQ people or people who are not white are unable to commit a crime. White people, especially Republicans, commit crimes all the time and end up in the paper uh, or your internet news feed because of that. 
And so I was surprised to learn that a trans Lutheran bishop was going to be asked to resign. Um, but then, oh, she's white. So she, she had no, it, she didn't have anything going for her. But uh, let's talk about this story, George. Megan Rohrer, R-O-H-R-E-R, -E -R, yeah. is the first avowed transgendered bishop in a mainline American denomination. She is the uh, Sierra Pacific, Sierra Nevada, San Francisco, Archbishop uh, for the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. And she identifies as transgender or intersex. I'm not quite certain what she identifies as. Well, since she was uh, consecrated as bishop, she has been in a fight with one of her parishes led by a gay Hispanic minister, and she's trying to shut the parish down. Mm -hmm. And she evidently did some things that were not on the up and up. Evidently, there are accusations of sticky fingers. Uh, there's accusations of bullying. There's accusations of lying. And this was brought to a head and taken to a disciplinary board. And it went up to the presiding bishop of the Lutheran Church in the USA, who said, I'm not going to put her on trial, but Bishop Megan, you should resign. And what I'm hearing from Lutheran sources is that, and you being up in Lutheran Central uh, in Wisconsin and Minnesota, uh, is that Lutherans are nice people. Uh, they don't want to. They don't want to have public scandals. Mm -hmm. So when you say, "I think you should resign," what is that really telling you, Kevin, in a Lutheran speak? Oh, in Lutheran speak, uh, do it before. Uh, we have coffee and tea after church next week. The, the sooner the better, absolutely. Um, I, and we're going to bring casserole to your resignation. You know, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, it, it's, I don't know. Th this one's a hard one. I, I, especially for Lutherans. I didn't think Lutherans would go far, far, this far to uh, consecrate a trans bishop. They did. And uh, uh, they're clearly still trying to protect her in some ways. Yeah. Well, it's just a shame because uh, it just holds up the church to further mockery. I mean, the uh, I could just well. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll keep it simple, George. We'll move on to the next story. You posted some articles by uh, Martin Percy over the last uh, few weeks, and he talks about the hypocrisy, which we've talked about already, of the Church of England and the corruption within the Church of England. We've talked about that already. The bad leadership within the Church of England, we've covered that extensively in our 10, 15 years here. And the uh, Christ Church Oxford has written a response to those. And I thought we could talk about that. Christ Church Oxford, the college on, at the Oxford University where Martin Percy was the dean of the cathedral and dean of the college. Mm -hmm has published its response to all of Martin Percy's claims. And it's very hard. It's They paint him as an opportunistic liar. They don't mm -hmm. use those words, but if you read it in its totality, some of the claims that Percy has made, they say are false, and that this is all about him wanting to get paid more. It's really nasty, mm -hmm. really. I mean, from an English perspective, this is nasty, nasty, nasty. So I think the civil war is going to continue because Martin Percy at this point probably has grounds for a uh, libel suit if what they are saying about him is not true. Uh, if what they're saying about him is true, then Martin Percy really is not the person he presented himself to be. Mm -hmm. If it's a lie, Martin Percy has every right and every, in fact, every duty to hit back and correct the record because this is just a terrible, terrible. I mean, in the insinuations of being greedy, of being slightly iffy with uh, girls. Um, there was this whole thing where he, he had allegedly patted the hair, stroked the hair of a girl um, who was a 29 year old uh, graduate student who was the verger in the cathedral. Uh, you know, you read Percy's account and it sounds ridiculous as it sounds, sex abuse by stroking hair. Mm -hmm. You read uh, the cathedral, you know, had every right and duty to make sure this pervert wasn't, you know, let loose. 
So I don't know the truth, veracity. I'm more inclined to believe Percy than I am Christchurch because I have a low opinion of academics to begin with. <laughs> and uh, uh, well, some you, of the things that they said to, are you, just... You went to Oxford, right? Yeah, and I found that as an American, I was a foreigner and sure. uh, a real foreigner. And yes. I'm, for some reason, people view me as being particularly American for some reason. Um, but so I was never part of the games, never an insider, never anything like that. And also, I was a priest, so you know, double despised. Uh, I was an I was an assistant chaplain at my college, and so they were happy for me to do the work that so the chaplain could just, you know, didn't have to do anything, mm. uh, pastoral work among students. Sure, but the, the nasty see the battles in college common rooms are far nastier than war between the Euro yeah. Ukraine and Russia, mm -hmm. because the stakes are so low. Yeah. Who gets the corner office who gets you know to be in charge of this committee and so they yeah. fight with the knives out and their knuckles you know they, because, because they're fighting over so little power to obtain they're not going to rule a nation they'll rule their office uh it's mm -hmm. done with blood and and death absolutely so i expect this saga to continue because martin percy is going to have to make some sort of response mm -hmm. either a denial or have his lawyers contact him because mm -hmm. this was nasty yes all right moving to our final story here uh as we reported a week or two ago there's a new uh episcopal bishop elected to the diocese of florida and can you, what's the geog what's the ge geography there Tallahassee, yeah. Tallahassee to Jacksonville, mm -hmm. down to Gainesville, and uh, a little south of St. Augustine. And then there's Cent Diocese of Central Florida, is just below that. Florida. And then, yeah. the, and then and then it splits southwest and southeast. Okay, all right. It's and then the panhandle, yeah. and then the panhandle, there's the fifth diocese, which is oh. the diocese of the uh, Central Gulf Coast. That's right. I so saw the, so the five, five Florida dioceses. Yeah, I saw the the first uh, church of the Episcopal Church in Key West. I, I visited that church when we were down there, and beautiful church. That would be a nice gig to get, George. All right, so let's talk about. Uh, no, Kevin, that's that church is famous for being on the cutting edge of the gay movement because you know right. Key West does have a absolutely a reputation. The, well, it has a reputation, and have a, a large memorial to all the people who died of AIDS. Um, and you, you clearly there's a, a lot of same-sex attracted people down there. Um, you're right about that, George. Let's talk about the new bishop of Florida. The, he seems to have without even taking office yet, not even consecrated, he has taken on a lot of flack from the LGBTQ acronym uh, community. Charlie Holt I've known for almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. He's a solid Orthodox Christian leader. I was so pleased when he was elected Bishop of Florida because he's exactly what that diocese needs to strengthen it, to revive it, to give it that, you know, He's, he's just as good as it gets, uh -huh. okay, in the in the clergy. Uh, Alex Farmers, the new bishop of the Gulf Atlantic, which is the Acne Diocese in roughly the same area, uh -huh. the two are peas in a pod as yeah. concerns their basic yeah. or theology and orthodoxy. So, I mean, I actually see good times ahead for both dioceses in their relationship. Well, Charlie, who was the most conservative candidate, was elected bishop. And the election, uh, the chance that they did not have enough clergy register for the for the election because they have a number of retired clergy who were scared of COVID and travel and this and that. So the chancellor made a ruling that clergy could vote electronically and participate via Zoom. Was this, this made, meeting, was this announcement made more than 24 hours before the meeting? Yes, it was. Okay. It's legal. And and the uh because prior conventions have been conducted via zoom mm -hmm. however the chancellor said that lay delegates because they are elected f to represent congregations they also have alternates so if they can't make it because of covid the alternate will go in their place mm -hmm. 
and there was no problem of meeting a, meeting a quorum with the lay delegates anyway. And so the vote was held, and Charlie won, I think, on the sixth ballot. Mm -hmm. Now, um, an objection was filed by members of the left of the left wing group within the convention, representing the sort of the pro gay parishes, saying that because this wasn't announced thirty days ahead of time or something, you know, it violated the canons, and the chancellor's views were wrong. And they've asked the national church to investigate the election and see if it conformed with canon law. Simultaneously, gay activists across the United States have started a letter writing campaign to the standing committees and bishops of the Episcopal Church, asking them not to approve Charlie's election. To be approved bishop, you have to have 50% plus one of the bishops and of the standing committee support you. Um, this is what happened to Mark Lawrence. First time around, he didn't get it because there were fears he would secede. He said he wouldn't, and second time around, he got the votes. This time, Charlie, there's no question of Charlie seceding or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But rather, the gay, gay activists will not tolerate any dissent from their new orthodoxy. That's right. And so... Now, I ultimately, I don't think the appetite is, certainly in the House of Bishops, Charlie will receive the necessary consents. The bishops are in no mood to refight the battles of the past. They want to get on because they've got more important things to worry about, which is the collapse of the Episcopal Church, numerically and financially. Sure. However, standing committees are different, and they may succeed there, but I'm thinking Charlie's going to pull this out. Because um, I just don't think there's the will at 8.15 to make Charlie a martyr and to so polarize the Diocese of Florida that it does a South Carolina. And he's also a second string martyr, or plan B. Uh, they got rid of all the original uh, uh, Orthodox, you know, 10 years ago, uh, 12 years ago. And so this is just one, there's, you know, five or six still remaining in the back. I don't think they're going to pick on him either. I think he gets, uh, you know. Yeah, but, but what does it, I mean, I think it's the, such good news. And mm -hmm. I think it's the moving of the spirit that Charlie was elected. Sure. Because I think we can see a reform and renewal. And I was so excited at our last show because it speaks to me about, you know, God using Florida as a place of uh, spiritual awakening for the Episcopal Church. Uh, that can basically turn the tide against what we've seen over the past uh, few decades. Yeah, it needs it, no question about it. Uh, well, uh, and actually, so pray for Charlie because yeah. I'm, this must be a horrible thing to go through because he's not done anything. It's just uh, the you know, it's just blatant prejudice. Yeah. They don't. They they will speak mutual flourishing. They do not believe in mutual flourishing. Just so you know, in case, in case you haven't figured that out yet. All right, George, great show. We'll try and get one out Friday. Um, pray for George's procedure tomorrow. He's going to have a cardio version. Uh, pray for Geico that they can find my records and that they agree to pay an insurance claim because I never filed before. Pray that I figure out how to do that. And uh, <clears throat> I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 734 of Anglican Unscripted.